Right, hello. Uh, my name's Tom Hume. I'm the managing director of Future Platforms. We're a little software company um, based in Brighton in the UK. We're just celebrating our 10th birthday this month. Ooh. And what we've always been about is taking mobile apps to market. So when we started out, we were doing Palm Pilot apps and WAP sites and those sorts of things. Over the years, that's, that's changed an awful lot. Um, we do a lot of work with startups. Uh, and we've been fortunate enough to work for some of the more successful mobile startups in, on the European scene. Um, we took Flutomatic, which, which might have come across to market. We did a lot of work for Zib, um, who were bought by Vodafone uh, and are now sort of part of the Vodafone 360 experience. And um, two of our clients are UK finalists in the Vodafone Mobile Clicks competition. So we've got a good lot of experience working for those sorts of companies, and they've got very interesting and unique needs. Um, and we also do a lot of work for larger businesses, Microsoft, Nokia, O2, Orange, those sorts of folks. Now, I've got a bit of a confession to make. I'm not actually a designer. And I don't think, given the other speakers that we've got on the roster here, that I should really even attempt to bluff my way into convincing you that I'm a designer. Um, what I can talk about, though, is how we make sure that design isn't treated as one department within the organization or a separate discipline how we roll it into the sort of larger process of, of getting products to market uh, at future platforms. Um, Rick's covered off some very specific practices. What I'd like to talk about is how we kind of integrate all that sort of stuff and plug it all together. So we do the full life cycle of software development, and there's all sorts of different practices that you can plug into that. But broadly speaking, you're doing this kind of stuff. You're working out what to do in the first place, working out how to do it, doing it, and then having a look at it and making sure that you can do it a bit, a bit better next time around or improve it. And sometimes people come to us and they just want a little bit of that. So you know, we did some concept work for Hasbro last year where we're just sort of looking at a specific thing for them and then you know, producing some videos and some mock-ups of how that might work. Sometimes people come to us and they've got a pretty good idea about what it is that they want to do. And we just do the sort of later part of the, of the life cycle just the build. But what we really, really love is when people come to us and they've got a really, really vague idea that there's something interesting in a certain sort of area and they want some help getting it all the way through to launch and beyond. Those are the projects that we really enjoy the most. And the one that I'm going to be referring to today in a lot of this is Roulette Cricket, which is one of those Vodafone mobile, mobile clicks um, finalists. So. That up there on the right, that's the brief for Roulette Cricket. It's a paper plate. Um, basically, the company is a little startup, and it's three guys, and they're all massive cricket fans. And what they found was they were going to cricket games, which you know might be a sort of a whole day event, and they get a paper plate, and they bet on where the next boundary was going to be um, during the game. So, you know, divide the paper plate up into quarters, pile coins up, up on the side and then you know, have a bit of fun playing that. And you know, the guys played it between themselves, and they thought, oh, this is quite a good laugh. And then their friends kind of liked it as well. And they thought, hmm, could be something interesting here. So they came to us, and that was pretty well the brief. And what we did was we kicked off their project the same way we kick off most of them, with a one-day workshop. And what we do at these workshops is we get, ideally, a few people from our customer together, because you always get slightly different perspectives on their business from different folks. And then we get a range of people from across our business there as well. We have a product owner, which is kind of cross between a business analyst and a project manager, I think. And we have members of our design team. And we have members of our development team, because they're good at spotting things that might be feasible or not feasible, or looking at opportunities that might lurk in the technology. And we get our testers along as well. Testers, massively underappreciated in the software industry, I think. Poor guys, they sort of sit at the end of the software lifecycle. Um, but they're the guys that feel all of the pain of usability problems. And they're the guys that are thinking about horrific sort of edge cases and nasty conditions that the rest of us like to sort of forget about. Their input can be absolutely invaluable. So we have all those folks in the room. And the inputs for this sort of session are things like audience research. We don't know our customers' audience as well as, as, well as they do. So they bring that. Um, we might do an expert review of their existing products, if there are any. They'll certainly come to us with an idea of what their business needs are. Um, we'll look at things like competitor review, you know, looking at what else is out there in the market, all that sort of stuff. 
hopefully have an idea of timescales, budgets, those kinds of things. And if we want to do something a little bit more conceptual, then we might take some stimulus. We might look at sort of recent projects from the arts or something like that, bring those in. So we can sort of have a little bit of, a little bit of more sort of left field stuff to get us all going. Um, and in the morning, we kind of set the scene. Um, we have a look at all of these things, various people present, and in the afternoon, we actually work on, on the product itself. And the output of that afternoon is ideally a list of prioritized features, so the kinds of things that we want to do. Uh, we'll have looked at what the typical risks might be. We'll have looked at dependencies, you know, who it is that, that needs to approve things, what other suppliers might be involved, all that kind of stuff. What, and ideally, we'll have an idea of what the key problems are that we're looking to solve as part of this session and just generally set ourselves up for scoping. So the purpose of this day is to kind of look at the, un look at the unknowns, spend a day all working together on a project, kind of set a sort of, set a tone for the whole thing and start building a relationship between us and the client. Sometimes if we're doing conceptual stuff, we'll follow this up by just going straight to concepts. So we'll produce some video production work or produce a prototype. Sometimes we go through to, to a little bit more detail. And the next step, which is kind of where concept work turns into planning, is bringing in this detail. At this point, we kind of know roughly what it is that we're trying to do, but we want to go into a bit more depth with it. We want to put a bit of meat on the bones. And what we like doing, actually very much echoing what Rick was saying, is starting out quite rough and putting in the detail a bit later. Uh, and we do that by actually avoiding digital tools uh, for, for quite a while. We work an awful lot on paper or index cards and that sort of stuff, um, mainly because We've noticed a tendency that if you, if you spend a couple of days working on something and you're working in Omnigraphel or Visio and you're producing an absolutely beautiful flow, you've thought, through a, you've thought through a problem and you think you've got an answer and you put together this wonderful document, it takes you a couple of days but it looks really great at the end of it. You get to the end of that couple of days and you look at it and there's a little alarm bell at the back of your head going, this is rubbish, this could be a lot better. Or you've had, you've had ideas of how to improve it in, in, in the course of those two days. You're quite emotionally invested in that product. You spent two days putting it together. Um, and you quite naturally don't want to throw it away because of all that time that you put into it. If it's on paper, you're kind of more, more likely to just go, nah, rubbish, screw it up, throw it away. Um, so we think that's, that's quite important that, that at this stage where you're getting ideas out and trying them out, you want to be able to throw them away really, really easily. Um, the other nice thing about working on paper is that you can actually start testing your stuff really early as well. Again, echoing what Rick was saying about the value of prototyping. Um, we have these kind of strange cartoony wooden phones that we use for testing. Mobiles are kind of a weird medium. It's kind of weirdly, weirdly intimate. Um, and we find that it's quite difficult to look at, at a wireframe document or a flowchart and, and think, oh, this will, this will feel absolutely right when it's in your hand. So what we like to do is to, is to get stuff onto sort of pastiche wooden phones and actually try it out, you know, move the cards around to, to simulate screen changes. Just go, yeah, does this feel right? And that's a really useful tool, again, for rejecting bad stuff early on before you've spent money on putting it into production. Um, and if you can do that without writing code, it's a lot, lot cheaper. So here are some of the sketches that we ended up with for the uh, Cricket product. Um, you can see we've worked out some of the basics, you know, animations, maybe how the betting interface would work. You've got a sort of, you know, a dial in the middle that corresponds to the pitch and you sort of swipe your finger around to select where you want to place a bet, all that kind of thing. This isn't exactly what we ended up with. I'll show you what we ended up with in a minute. But it's a kind of rough feel for it all. Now, these sketches, they aren't, they aren't specifications. These aren't documents that you could email off to a team in, in Estonia or, or Bangalore and, and get a product back a couple of months later. It's, it's not about that, and they're not meant to be exhaustive. Um, they're a kind of communications medium to help us clarify and, and discuss the product, but they don't substitute for actually having that discussion in any way, shape, or form. Um, and we think that, again, another slightly different thing about mobile is that it's quite difficult to comprehensively document, because there's lots and lots of little edge cases and things that can happen. A phone call might come in and interrupt your application at any moment. Battery might run out. You might drive through a tunnel and lose network coverage. A lot of things that you take for granted in a desktop context or on the web, you kind of lose when you come to mobile. Uh, and that makes exhaustive documentation uh, unusually difficult. Uh, if you do need a sort of a big written specification, you're going to have to brief out the work to a team you'll never meet, then you need to do a lot more. And Personally, I think you're going you're to hit some problems doing that sort of stuff anyway. And then we go through to uh, visuals. This is usually around the sort of time that production starts as well. Um, 
Some people draw a distinction between visual design and, and interaction design. We kind of, again, tend to see the two as, as, as fairly blurred. I mean, if you look on, on these screens, you've got a sort of little 3D effect. I'm just going to take a small example of this. A little, little 3D effect on that play button there that kind of screams, press me. I'm a pressable thing. I'm in three dimensions. And that's a kind of a little visual hint to an interaction mechanic. And there's lots and lots of those throughout a decent interface. I don't think you can divide a product necessarily into, into interaction and visual so clearly. Um, we make a point of revisiting the execution frequently throughout the life cycle. Probably all seen amazing designs that then when it actually came to getting executed were a bit rubbish by the time they got done. And we want to try and avoid that sort of thing by keeping the design team involved in looking over these things all throughout the project. Not just handing it off and, and then at the end when it's rubbish saying, well, the concept's great. And we also consider constraints quite carefully throughout the whole life cycle. So, you know, there'll be technical constraints, but perhaps even more importantly, you're constantly going to be working under time and budget constraints. And so you need to consider very, very carefully where you put your effort and do that very, very consciously. So, you know, are you going to add polish to the existing application or are you going to work on new features? If you don't consider this stuff quite carefully, then you'll end up making tacit decisions rather than deliberate ones about where your spend's going. And you, you want to be spending as carefully as you can. Um, again, cross-disciplinary stuff can really help out here. Where you've got a team of designers, developers, and testers working together, you can sort of sometimes see little opportunities that might not have otherwise occurred to you. Little sort of force multipliers that let you get a disproportionate bang for your buck, if you like. And you'll learn a lot at this stage as well. I mean, we realized at this stage uh, in Roulette Cricket that users might get distracted. They might not spend five hours at a time staring at their phone. They might put it down. They might be at work, you know, listening to the cricket whilst they're, you know, tapping out emails, that sort of thing. So we need to, if something happens that they need to see, then we need to provide a little hint that you know, something happened here a little while ago. You can go back and have a look at it now. All that sort of stuff. I don't want to talk much about development today, but throughout the production process, one thing that we try and do everywhere is bridge as many gaps as possible. Now, internally, cross-disciplinary teams all kind of sitting together. That's great. Um, but we also make a point of working very, very closely with our customers, at an absolute minimum, getting them down and getting them in front of the whole team, not just the project manager, every two weeks. And we use those meetings to demonstrate what's been done, to commiserate about the stuff that you know, we tried to do and then couldn't, to celebrate the things that we got right, look for risks, potentially reprioritize the rest of the project, all that kind of stuff. And sometimes we even sketch out some of the you know, rough design work that's going to be coming in the next couple of weeks. So what this meant was that in the run-up to the Indian Cricket Championships earlier this year, we suddenly thought it'd be really, really nice to get a product out there to get some real people using this stuff and to learn about what, what they've been doing and how they've been using it. And we ended up reprioritizing a whole load of stuff to allow us to do that kind of thing. And you can only do that when you've got sort of very, very, very close, engaged customers. The other nice thing, and we've had this happen particularly a couple of times this year, is that when you have a customer who's very, very clear on the vision, who's very, very clear about what it is that they want to do, that it's really good to get them in front of the team regularly because it kind of, you drift off course slightly, quite naturally throughout a long development, and it just continually brings you back. And we found that really, really useful. Every time we've done this sort of stuff, it's really, really helped. Um, and I guess the sort of canonical example for us was a, a project that we did for Microsoft uh, last year. It was about a, a nine-month project, and we were working with a team in China, in Shenzhen. So what we ended up doing there was um, actually relocating 10 out of, I think at the time, 13 of us over to Shenzhen for a couple of weeks, where we worked alongside the design designers who'd been flown in from Shanghai and alongside a design team and a development team uh, in Shenzhen to tackle those really nasty design problems, to use the common shared language of a whiteboard to discuss this sort of stuff and to, and to really get into detail, to build a relationship with them based on trust and to deliver an early milestone. And that really, really helped. It doesn't finish when you've launched. We've, uh, we do a lot of analytics. We do a lot of stuff on our, on our um, products once they've gone out to market. Uh, and we learn an awful lot doing that. I'm a little bit short on time, so I'll just cover off the one on the left-hand side. This was for a different project um, for some guys we were selling puzzles to, um, crosswords and Sudoku on your phone. Um, we thought that the, uh, and they thought, uh, that the top time for people buying puzzles was going to be on the commutes to work in the morning. And then we did the analytics. 
about when people are actually buying this stuff. And you can see the peak times are just before and after dinner in the evening. Completely changed their view of how to, how to market the product. They end up doing a completely separate set of activities to, uh, to effectively promote their puzzles. And we'd all got it completely wrong. And you only learn these sort of really, really big surprising things by examining what you've done afterwards. So, a few things that we still don't understand, and I'll rock it through these a little bit. Um, it's all very well doing this stuff internally, but if there's someone outside your organization who's then validating your work at the very end, we haven't worked out how, what they can validate that against unless they've got a, a big document to work from. Don't know about that one. You can't write it at the end. You can't build a product, then write about the product, then give them the product and the thing that you've just written, and say, now check it's okay. That's patently ridiculous. Ooh, time's up, applause. Um, there's a lot of churn. When you've got designers and developers working together, and they're both informing one another, you end up doing a lot of rework. Uh, and it feels like wasted effort. Uh, and we're not sure whether that's a problem that we need to solve to avoid doing that, or whether that's just a natural consequence of working this way. Haven't worked that one out yet. And understanding um, customers better at the very early stages. Is that product manager really able to make these decisions, or are they getting overridden by the, by the CEO? actually, when, when they go away and show off the product internally. What does that mean for us? All this sort of stuff. I'll zap through the final lessons. Things that we've learned, and I've covered these off mainly already. Um, start really well. Start by getting everyone together. Put effort into that sort of stuff, because it sets the tone for the whole project. It makes a massive difference. Collaborate the whole way through. Don't just do a post-mortem at the end, or sort of, you know, three monthly reviews, that kind of thing. Get together as often as you can. It really helps. Pursue the correct fidelity. Don't start producing beautiful documentation from day one. You'll spend your, the rest of the project just revising these incredibly expensive, difficult to produce documents. Equally, don't, get ske don't stay sketchy for the whole way through. If you do that sort of stuff, then you're abdicating design decisions to development team. And you need to be making those decisions by sort of qualified individuals. Communicate the vision strongly throughout the whole project. Get everyone back on track frequently. And narrow every single gap that you can across disciplines, across organizations, across cultures, everywhere. OK, thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs>、Hi. Um, I'm not really tall, so hi. <laughs>、um, what you're saying from your presentation is you don't need incredibly expensive interaction designs and technical specifications and all that kind of stuff.、Um, what, what kind of project, well, what kind of method?、Uh, um, how are you talking to your customer? And you have to well, break down the rules on what. What are we going to do the coming few weeks?、Uh, what kind of design well, do you do for that?、Um, well, the kind of things that we've done lots of were these. So these are, these are done on you know, pen and paper and then just scanned in very, very quickly and put into a PDF. So really, really quick to produce. And you can iterate them really, really fast because you only need to get them into the PDF at the very end. And this is great for giving to a design team at, at the customer's end or actually showing to the customer themselves. They can look at this. And they, they understand that it's, they're not going to get something that actually looks like pen, pencil and paper, but they can get a feel for, the, for what the concept is. So, exactly this has worked really well for us. It's all just a communications mechanism. There was one more question here, I think. At least I saw a few hands. Okay? No?、Um, no. Let me、uh, ask the final question before the break.、Um, Can you tell us something about your team? Because you introduced it very briefly, but I think you have a very multidisciplinary team. How does that work in, in, in practice?、Um, yeah, I mean, we,、um, we have two teams internally. Each team has three developers, one designer, one tester, and is front ended by this role called a product owner, which, if you know Scrum, it's, it, it comes from that, from that methodology.、Um, and We sit them all together. So they're all kind of looking over each other's shoulder. They're all aware of what everyone else is kind of up to throughout the working day.、Um, and you get lots and lots of little micro interactions throughout the day between these people, which are really, really helpful.
You know, someone will, will look at something that someone else is doing and go, well, have you thought about doing it this way? We get lots of ideas coming into, coming into, our, into our process from all across the board. It's not, it's not like um, you know, our designers, for instance, are, are pushing our development team to do a little bit more with the tools and technology that they produce, and our development team are throwing ideas in there, and our QA guys are going, this will be horrible. And, you know, very, very early on, and we catch that. Cool. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Tom.